Kingdom of Denmark, Government, Constitutional Monarchy, Ruler, Christian X, Area, 15.5 thousand square miles, Population, 2.5 million, Military, 58,000 men, 3 battle cruisers, 3 light cruisers, 20 torpedo boats, 2 submarines, and seven other smaller craft. Denmark at the start of the Great War was a mere shell of a power that it once was throughout history. From the late 14th to early 16th centuries, the nation held political control over the Kalmar Union, a union between the crowns of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and their respective territories. This was a powerful entity in medieval Europe, but was plagued by internal troubles and devastating wars against foreign powers, which saw support, especially in Sweden, fall dramatically. This continued until Swedish independence in 1525, and Norway's nobility had been largely wiped out from the Black Death years previous, and never fully recovered. Due to this, in 1536, Norway, as well as her colonial possessions, were listed as Danish provinces. For the next three centuries, the nation was in near constant wars, mostly against Sweden. The nation tended to not fare well in these wars, and her lost territory during the 17th century, combined with the rise of the Swedish Empire, saw what was somewhat of an end to the thought of Danish ability for dominance in the region. With the end of the Great Northern War at the turn of the 18th century, both Scandinavian powers were severely weakened, as nations such as Russia cobbed to both states administratively, which was their main advantage against much more populous powers. The end of the Napoleonic Wars saw Denmark on the losing side, having to cede mainland Norway to the Swedes. In 1864, Prussia and Austria had went to war over the duchies of Svelzig and Holstein, ending in a humiliating defeat for the Danes, and the loss of a large amount of land. After this loss, the Danish colonial possessions around the world were sold off to various powers. The defeat also heavily shaped the change in Danish politics. They focused more on internal development, such as an expansion of agriculture and industry, while promoting neutrality and trade externally. The Social Liberal Party rose to prominence in the 1913 election, with Karl Theod Saleh becoming Prime Minister until 1920. His government would introduce some progressive reforms and gave women the right to vote in 1915, but their main focus was towards keeping neutrality. However, due to Denmark's strategic position at the mouth of the Baltic Sea, this would prove to be difficult. The outbreak of war was met with widespread anxiety in Denmark. Insecurity about the future immediately led to a run on the gold deposit of the National Bank, and in August, the government suspended the gold convertibility of the Krone. In early August, the government passed emergency legislation that empowered the government to ban exports, regulate prices, and compensate food, among other things. Even though Denmark had a strong and highly efficient agricultural sector, it was extremely export-oriented. This meant that Denmark relied on imports not only for food and raw materials, but also for food and animal feed. In 1913, about a third of the grain consumed in Denmark was imported. Therefore, it was of crucial importance for Denmark to secure access to foreign supplies and to control both the use and prices of its limited resources. The government did its best to keep trade open between Britain and Germany and herself. The Germans were far more cooperative as the exports to Germany were very important, as overseas trade was rather limited, even more so once Italy joined the war. The army was mobilized August 1st of 1914 and reached its peak of 58,000 men by the end of the year. This force was extremely costly to maintain and only worsened supply issues, especially in Copenhagen, where the majority were stationed, and this was further compounded by a, a gradual migration from the countryside to cities as the war went on, with over 30,000 people moving into the city. Although trade had largely stayed the same during the war years, there was a massive problem with inflated prices. Prices rose immensely, and the government introduced subsidiary programs and social relief programs to combat housing and food costs for the regular population. This was actually met with pretty good success, and was funded by, by a new wave of taxes. The new taxes were clearly progressive, and served to counter, at least to some degree, the very strong trend of growing gaps between the rich and poor in Denmark. In the end of 1916, the German High Command wanted to reintroduce unrestricted submarine warfare in late 1916, but they didn't, fearing that neutral nations may enter the war if they did so. But they weren't worried about the US. The Romanian campaign, which started in August, had stretched the German army so thin that had Denmark joined the war due to shipping losses, 
there were virtually no forces to block the route to Berlin. It was until after the Romanians were defeated in the field that the submarine campaign got the go-ahead. Speaking of the US, Denmark sold some of its last colonies, St. Croix, St. John, and St. Thomas, now the US Virgin Islands, for the sum of 25 million, which is now 550 million in today's currency. They weren't really viable anymore and were open to any potential hostile power. The funds from the sale, plus the already mentioned legislation back home, made possible that the budget deficiencies were held at reasonable levels, and Denmark faced the post-war years with a manageable public debt. If you'd like to learn more about the other Scandinavian countries during the First World War, click here for the episodes that will eventually be uploaded on both Sweden and Norway. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys next time.